I know I haven't vlogged in a while. I thought I would pop in and say hello and let you know that I'm still thinking about it and uh, and all that. I, I haven't had a lot to say recently. It's been a very interesting and difficult time for a lot of us uh, in the Joe and I church. Yeah, I don't know. Today I am helping out at the uh, second annual Taste of the Arts uh, Festival at the Chelmsford Center for the Arts. <laughs> thinking about art and how art is the language of gnosis really in a in a very real sense I mean you have uh, certainly a lot of Gnostic scriptures that are, are written in a very literary poetic style I would say the prime way that gnosis is communicated in the 21st century anyway is through movies in the 20th century uh, also you know uh, back then, way back then, um, <laughs> 17 years ago. It seems that the the one way that people find to talk about Gnosis and, and the Gnostic experience and, and mystical experiences in general is usually in some sort of artistic expression that kind of transcends uh, language. Here, here it was like super bad. It was like mystical experiences are, are really difficult to talk about with uh, people who haven't had them and I know that sounds a bit like a cop-out you know and a lot of people will say that it is but you have um, these experiences that go beyond the things that we normally talk about and that we have language to talk about and so as a result the way that you communicate these things to others is through the um, intentional triggering of memories, I would say, of these states that happen through uh, more visual um, mediums, whether that's directly visual or through poetic language and things like that. Easier said than done. It's why the Gnostic scriptures tend to come across so, quite frankly, ridiculous with their um, layers of cosmologies and visionary ascents and, you know, not just the Gnostic scriptures, the canonical scriptures as well. These are the these are the ways that we have. These are the tools that we have to communicate these experiences. I'm reminded of when I was in art school. I, I went to UMass Lowell, and um, one of my professors, uh, Craig Freeman, John Craig Freeman, um, was a student of this guy named uh, Gregory Ulmer, and. Uh, uh, Dr. I believe Almer was a professor of English somewhere wherever uh, wherever Craig had his uh, you know did his education and Greg coined this term called electricy which was kind of a post literacy um, he described it and I will paraphrase poorly that you know before writing um, people were um, whatever the word for the whatever the concept was before literacy you know so people understood each other through spoken word uh, exclusively um, and then when writing was invented <coughs> literacy became the way that uh, knowledge was preserved and maintained and then there is a post literacy thing that's happening right now that he called electricy where it was a more um, it was communication in kind of symbolic uh, sense and he essentially predicted the rise of emoji and um, gifs as communication or gifs depending on <laughs> which <laughs> which side of that debate you fall down on and I think that that really uh, is setting the stage for a greater communication of spiritual experience that was primarily the realm of artists and mystics before um, something that can now be communicated fairly easily and fairly comprehensively using kind of the visual metaphors uh, that we use today. Communicating via um, 
via methods that transcend both the spoken and the written language um, in a way that builds upon both of those things. You know, when people started reading, they didn't stop talking to each other in the same way that when uh, people uh, get more and more comfortable uh, speaking visually in the, in the sense of electricity, um, the, uh, <laughs> they, they won't stop writing or talking to each other. So all of this sort of begs the question, I guess, why, why Gnosis? Why, why do we care? You know, why have I spent so much time, uh, you know, so much of my life and sacrificed quite a bit to, to pursue this? And, and I guess the answer is because I can't not. Um, on the one hand, it makes your life a bit worse. Um, <laughs> realizing and understanding the reality of the world, um, e even in such a limited way, you know, it's, it's, um, it leads to pessimism <laughs> to a certain extent. Um, it, but on the other hand, I think it leads to, uh, it comes back around to optimism in that, yeah, the world's not great. Like, everybody kind of agrees. The world is pretty bad. And there's a lot of things wrong with it. But at the end of the day, it's also the best thing that there is. I think it does make your life better, at the end of the day. I, I think, I really do. I mean, it, it has for me, anyway. Um, it's, it's given me a direction. It's frustrating and hard and all of those things, but it's, I think, the most rewarding thing that I've ever been a part of. Those moments of insight, those flashes of realization that, you know, you are above all of this, you know, and, and it's not, not in an elitist sense, although kind of, but that literally you are, you belong to something higher and everybody does. And, that, and once you understand that, all of the stupid little differences are just that. They're stupid and little. And we don't have a lot of time here to realize that and to act on it. And so I think it's important that we do. So I guess the moral of the story is that if, if there's a way to communicate this gnosis, that bypasses your logical circuits, you know, however, however brains and minds and all of that stuff work. If there's a way to kind of get past the analytical, um, logical, like I'm going to explain all of this to you, part of your, your brain, your consciousness, then, you know, then let's try and do that. Let's, let's try and make the world a little bit better through the spreading of gnosis. I mean, the, the, the whole, the tagline, I guess, the, the motto of the Gnostic Wisdom Network is spreading the light of gnosis. And, uh, you know, we, we do that a lot intellectually. That's what we do a lot of here on this channel. But, you know, there's a, there's a whole other layer of more effective communication, maybe, that, uh, that has to do with art and beauty and poetry and all of that stuff. Uh, so let's give it a shot. Let me know if you have any ideas. I think I want to close the vlog today with a clip that I recorded at this, this year's conclave, this past May, of uh, uh, Reverend Dr. Juliana Eimer's um, interview, the brief interview that I did with her um, and, uh, and we pray for, for her and for her family and for her husband, Mar Thomas, and, uh, eternal rest grant unto her, O Lord, and let perpetual light shine upon her. Reverend Subdeacon Juliana Eimer. So you have, uh, you've been hanging around with us for a while. Mm -hmm. Um, 
Which conclave? How many conclaves is this for you, do you think? This is my seventh. Oh, that's great. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> Each one better than the last, I'm Absolutely. Sure. <laughs> so um, what are you excited about this year? What, what's, what's been most interesting to you? Um, well, I've enjoyed all of the presentations, uh, the little workshops, but I have to say the thing that has been most exciting to me has been the opportunity to meet the local community. Uh, we, I got to stay at the home of Cherry and Dave yeah, Russell yeah. and their hospitality was just extraordinary. And I really loved the opportunity to meet the local congregation in a way mm -hmm. that isn't always possible at these right. things. So I'd say meeting the people and getting to know them better was probably the most exciting thing for me.